Hello and welcome back to this course on critical learnings on forest and adivasi rights. Part 3 of this course focuses on the convergence of the Forest Rights Act 2006 with other laws. In this last session, we will learn about the interlinkages between the Right to Information Act 2005 or the RTI Act and the FRA. In this lecture, we will discuss the salient features of the RTI Act the institutional structures and the processes provided in the act after that we will explore the possibility of using rti as a tool in furthering democratic forest governance judicial precedents have recognized the right to information as a fundamental right it has been read into the right to freedom of speech and expression under article 191a as well as the right to life under article 21 eight states had already passed laws on the right to information even before the RTI act was passed in 2005 for example the delhi government enacted the delhi right to information act in 2001 the RTI act was finally passed by the parliament in 2005 after a long struggle and sustained advocacy the movement was led by a coalition of activists and grassroots workers across the country the movement demanded transparency in public spending and states accountability on policy and governance now this law applies to the entire country through this act people's fundamental right to information was strengthened section 3 of the rti act empowers all citizens to file an rti application to seek information from the public authorities The right to information is defined under Section 2J of the RTI Act. It includes the right to inspection of work, documents, and records. It also includes taking notes, extracts, or certified copies of documents, taking certified samples of materials, and accessing information in electronic form or through printouts. Information is defined under Section 2F of the RTI Act. Information is understood as any material in print as well as in electronic form. The RTI Act is only applicable to a public authority as defined under Section 2H of the Act. The term public authority means an authority or body or institution of self-government established under the Constitution. or a central or state law it also includes a body owned controlled or substantially financed by the government an ngo which is directly or indirectly substantially financed by the government is also a public authority under section 4 of the rti act all public authorities are required to proactively place information in the public domain so a public authority is required to maintain all its records publish information about its institutional structure its functioning and powers the details of programs and schemes run by it and the information related to policy decisions which affect the public it is obliged to provide reasons for its administrative and quasi judicial decisions to affected persons the law requires suo moto disclosure of such information at regular intervals from a public authority these provisions are designed to promote an environment of transparency any information about an arbitrary decision by any public authority can be accessed by common people and be challenged in the courts We will now learn about the institutional structures and processes under the RTI Act for making an RTI application and for seeking information. The Act envisages a three-tier structure of authorities for its enforcement at the level of the central and the state governments. At the first tier, every public authority is required to designate a public information officer or a PIO. to receive and respond to RTI queries at the second tier every public authority has to designate an officer who is senior in rank to the PIO as the first appellate authority 
At the third tier, the Central or State Information Commission is constituted by the respective governments. The RTI application to the PIO can be submitted in writing either physically or through electronic means. It can be written in English or Hindi or in the official language of the area concerned. If a person is unable to give the RTI application in writing, in that case, the PIO is obliged to provide reasonable assistance to that person to reduce an oral request into writing. The applicant does not need to provide any reasons for seeking information under the law. An application fee is charged for filing the RTI application. But the RTI Act and rules exempt persons falling below the poverty line from the payment of any fee while seeking information. This provision is particularly important to the Dalit, Adivasi and weaker sections of our society. They depend on social security schemes such as the public distribution system or the PDS, the midday meal and Manrega. They can seek information on spendings made under these schemes through RTI. It is also an important tool to ensure their rights under the Forest Rights Act 2006. It will be dealt with in detail later. After an application is made under Section 7 of the RTI Act, the PIO has to provide information within 30 days of the receipt of the RTI application. Failure to decide the application within the prescribed time is deemed as a refusal of the request. Where the application is rejected, the PIO has to communicate the reasons for rejection along with the details of the appellate authority. An RTI applicant who is aggrieved by the decision of the PIO or did not receive the information can prefer an appeal before the first appellate authority. First appeal shall be preferred either within 30 days from the receipt of the decision or from the expiry of the prescribed time. The first appellate authority can on a case-to-case -case basis admit the appeal even after this period of limitation is over. If it is satisfied that the appellant was prevented by sufficient cause from filing the appeal in time. The first appeal has to be disposed of within 30 days of the receipt of the appeal or 45 days from the date of filing the appeal. The second appeal must be filed before the Central or State Information Commission within 90 days from the date on which the first appellate authority's decision was made or actually received by the appellant. The Information Commissions may condone the delay in filing an appeal if they are satisfied that the appellant was prevented by sufficient cause from filing the appeal. There is no time limit specified for disposal of second appeal. The Commission's decision is binding on the appellant and the public authority. It is important to note that in the appeal process, the burden of proof regarding the justification of the denial of request remains with the PIO. Rule 8 of the Right to Information Rule 2012 provides a list of documents that have to be submitted along with an appeal to the Central Information Commission. Rule 10 clearly provides that the Central Information Commission simply cannot dismiss an appeal because it has not been made in a specified format, as long as it is accompanied by the documents provided in Rule 8. The Central Information Commission and the State Information Commissions under the RTI Act have been imagined as the adjudicatory authority. They can seek accountability and compliance from the public authorities and their PIOs if they fail to provide information. In Section 18 of the RTI Act, the Central and State Information Commissions have wide-ranging powers to receive and inquire into complaints from any person if they were unable to get information due to arbitrary processes. They can summon any public record from any court or public office because these institutions are vested with the powers of a civil court under the Code of Civil Procedure 1908. The Commission has also been given penal powers under Section 20. The Commission can impose penalties 
and recommend disciplinary actions under the relevant service rules against a PIO. If they refuse to receive an RTI application or fail to furnish information within the prescribed time, denying an RTI request maliciously, knowingly giving incorrect, incomplete, or misleading information, destroying information, or obstructing in furnishing information also attracts penalty and disciplinary actions. This gives the aggrieved person an avenue to record their complaint. It ensures compliance by the public authority for giving the information sought by the applicant. The RTI Act lays down some restrictions on the right to information. It is important to remember that these are very narrow and have also been narrowly interpreted by the courts. While rejecting an RTI request based on these restrictions, clear reasons have to be recorded in writing by the PIO. Section 8, Clause 1 provides for certain exemptions from the general principle of disclosure of information. However, Section 8, Clause 2 specifically provides that a public authority may allow access to information. It is regardless of the exemptions under Section 8, Clause 1 or anything contained in the Official Secrets Act 1923 in larger public interest. It is important to note here that the RTI Act overrides the Official Secrets Act or any other law that is inconsistent with it. Apart from that, information involving a third party is also exempt, but the exemption is not absolute. A third party can make a submission to the PIO about whether the information can be disclosed or not. The PIO can make a decision to disclose the information if the public interest outweighs any harm posed to the third party. Some central and state level security and intelligence organizations specified in the second schedule of the RTI Act are excluded from its purview. Such exclusion is, however, not absolute. Information pertaining to human rights violations or allegations of corruption can be sought, but such information can only be provided after the approval of the respective information commission. The grounds for the rejection of an RTI request are often misused to deny access to information. It can be gauged from the 2019 2020 Annual Report of the Central Information Commission. We must remember that these grounds have to be clearly specified through a reasoned order. An RTI request cannot be turned down merely because part of the information is exempted from disclosure. These exemptions are exceptions, not the rule. We have now established that RTI is a crucial instrument for seeking accountability from the government. Now, we will explore the links between the RTI and the FRA. The RTI is an important instrument for bringing about greater transparency in the decisions of bodies constituted for the recognition of rights under FRA, such as the Subdivisional Level Committee or the SDLC, the District Level Committee or the DLC, and the State Level Monitoring Committee or the SLMC. If the SDLC makes any recommendation and the DLC takes a decision for the rejection of claims, then they have to provide reasons for rejection. The principles of natural justice also require the recording of reasons. However, these conditions are hardly met under the FRA. This is where the RTI comes to the rescue. The Sangathans engaged with the forest rights movement have used the RTI to challenge the arbitrary rejection of claims. They have taken the state and central government to courts in several writ petitions in various constitutional courts. We can learn from the case of Janmukti Sangharsh Vahini versus State of Bihar and others about using the RTI strategically. Hundreds of FRA claims from different districts of Bihar were arbitrarily and illegally rejected. The STLCs did not provide any reasonable opportunity of hearing to the claimants. Even the rejection order was not sent and communicated to them. Therefore, the claimants were also deprived from filing an appeal before the DLC. Janmukti Sangharshwahini, a local Sangathan, 
filed RTI application seeking answer for the reasons of rejection of claims. The administration cited a list of reasons for the rejection, none of which were as per law. This led the petitioners to file a writ of mandamus at the Patna High Court seeking directions from the court for implementation of the FRA and a review of the rejected claims. The Patna High Court passed a judgment in November 2020 directing the petitioners to file an appeal before the STLC and the DLC. The court directed the STLC and the DLC to hear the appeal within a given time frame. Therefore, the Right to Information Act is immensely relevant. It can become instrumental for guaranteeing rights through intervention in court. The power of the Gram Sabha for giving free prior and informed consent in cases of forest land diversion can also be strengthened through the RTI. When a land has to be acquired from a forest dwelling community for industrial, mining or developmental purposes, Gram Sabha's consent is required as provided in the famous Nyamgiri judgment. Section 4, Clause 5 of the FRA also clearly states that the forest dwellers shall not be evicted or removed from forest land under their occupation till the recognition and verification procedure is complete. In the absence of reliable information, it is difficult for the Gram Sabha to understand the terms of an acquisition. It cannot make any informed choice without reliable information. It cannot ascertain whether regulatory processes such as the assessment of damage to the ecology, wildlife and individuals facing displacement have been carried out as per law. Moreover, before any mining activity commences, a project proponent is required to place information regarding the project in the public domain. This information should be made available in the local language. However, this requirement is also frequently flouted. The RTI can prove useful for obtaining such information. The fact that anyone can file an RTI application without having to provide reasons also empowers the activists working on the environmental and forest rights issues to seek accountability on behalf of the affected persons. Both laws try to displace power and its function in a young democracy like India by entrusting it with the people. In this session, we learnt about how the RTI Act can be utilised to seek rights under the FRA. Laws do not operate in a vacuum. We need to understand the synergies between various rights-based laws. It will help us take steps towards guaranteeing the rights given to us in the Constitution. Thank you for watching.